Close Source is brought to you with support from the following sustainable brands. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycled clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Picnic wear, a slow fashion brand made by hand in New York City from vintage and dead stock textiles. Picnic wear strives for minimal waste, but maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Find Picnic wear on Instagram at Picnic wear, and that's wear, W-E-A-R, and at www.picnicwear.com. No flight back vintage, bringing fun new life to old things always using recycled and secondhand materials to make dope ass shit for dope ass people. See more on Instagram at no flight back vintage shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon with a focus on natural fibers, simple, hardworking designs and putting fat people first discover more at shiftwheeler.com late to the party, creating one of a kind statement clothing from vintage salvaged and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room, all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of L.A., we love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Shop Journal Vintage, specializing in upcycled, handmade, and vintage fashion for all genders. Owner Laura makes each piece by hand with love in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, With an emphasis on upcycled menswear, tie-dye, modern jewelry, cottagecore collars, and everything in between, Shop Journal makes pieces they love and hopes you will too. Getting dressed should always be fun. See more on Instagram at shop underscore journal. Old Flame Mending helps you keep your clothes intact through clothing repair, visible mending, and tailoring. Through extending the life of textiles, Old Flame Mending makes your pieces not only wearable and functional again, but also unique and beautiful. This mending duo is based in Pittsburgh, but they take mail-in mending orders from anywhere in the U.S. For more information, visit them at oldflamemending.com or follow them on Instagram at oldflamemending. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer, but Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro-business. She's the one-woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one-woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made-to-measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at DylanPage.com and find us on Instagram at DylanPageLifeAndStyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Wide-Eyed Vintage, a curator of truly covetable vintage from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wide-Eyed Vintage encourages the experimental spirit of dressing up and will provide you with all the special pieces that will make your wardrobe truly unique. 
Dedicated to preserving the craftsmanship of clothes, wide-eyed vintage only selects pieces that are well-made, pieces that have been proven to last beyond their lifetimes, so you too can enjoy them for more lifetimes to come. See more on Instagram at wide underscore eyed underscore vintage. Karen Kinney Studio. Located in Western Massachusetts, Karen specializes in handcrafted earrings from found, upcycled, and repurposed fabrics, as well as other eco-friendly curios, all with a hint of nostalgia, a dollop of whimsy, a dash of color, and 100% fun. Karen is an artist slash designer who believes the materials we use matter. See more on Instagram at Karen Kinney Studio or online at www.cKinney.com. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. St. Evans is a New York City-based vintage retailer that is dedicated to bringing you those special vintage pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just an online store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 20% of all sales are donated to a new charitable organization each month, amplifying and supporting causes like food insecurity, racial justice, homelessness, and LGBTQ plus support. For the month of March, St. Evans is supporting the Chicago Period Project, an organization that empowers homeless and in-need people to experience their periods with dignity. This feminist grassroots organization distributes pads, tampons, underwear, and other critical menstruation supplies to local shelters, schools, and crisis support networks. Your vintage purchase from St. Evans supports a small, women of color run business while giving back to the collective community we're all a part of. New Vintage is released every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time at wearsaintevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's at where St. Evans. Shop Vintage do good, and wear St. Evans. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Welcome to Clothes Horse, the podcast that, I mean, this podcast has spring fever really hard and also some hay fever too. <laughs> I'm just so excited about the warmer weather and longer days. It's just filling me with optimism and I hope it's doing the same for you. I'm your host, Amanda. Well, welcome to episode 63. I am can't really say that this episode has a solid theme, <laughs> um, but it's all in line with the themes of Consumption Month, which other people like to call March. And it's a really good group of segments, whether they thematically work or not. <laughs> 
Today, friend of the pod, Jem, you know her, you love her. She's a regular around here. She becomes our first ever correspondent, perhaps reporter on the scene, if you will, when she interviews her dad, aka Mr. Masland, about his experiences and ideas around clothing and style. I loved listening to this conversation so much. We don't get enough derriere mentions on this show, so I can't wait for you to hear it. (laughs) Before that, I'll talk with Susan Massey about her experiences for the last few decades selling and wearing vintage. And I also have a hotline call from Amy of the Velvet Underground. And then... I mean, you're like, how could there even be more, Amanda? Well, I also have some helpful advice about reusing packaging when you're reselling from Tatum. Someone, one of you, I would assume, wrote an amazing review on Apple Podcasts last weekend that declared, quote, Clothes Horse is not just a podcast, it's a community. And I'm really excited about how much this episode highlights different members of our community. I'm actively, seriously, all the time, thinking of new ways for all of you to participate in the podcast. So stay tuned for that. Speaking of our community, a few exciting things are happening right now. For one, clotheshorse.world, the official blog of our community, is hiring for three residency roles. We've realized that we just cannot grow or reach new people with the tiny staff we have right now. Um, We're working all the time. So we want to bring some more people into the fold. These roles involve a consistent commitment of about 10 hours per week for three months. I'll be sharing a lot more details around it on Wednesday's episode. So stay tuned. Next up, two ideas that I just want you to think about. We can talk about later. I'm hoping to do some live shows in a city near you in late summer, early fall. That means I am assuming that maybe some people would like to come see a clothes horse live recording. (laughs) So yeah, that could be a gamble in itself, but clothes horse might go on tour or something like that. If you think your city is interested in hanging out with me for a live recording, please get in touch and bonus points if you have a venue in mind, because this is a whole new world to me and I also have had many, many parties in my lifetime where lots of people RSVP'd on Facebook and almost no one came. So I'm a little anxious about it, (laughs) but I also am really excited about meeting all of you. And the other idea I have, another thing to just think about is a clothes horse jamboree. Uh, Fall here in Lancaster County is so beautiful. I'm thinking a weekend event where we have different presentations, we all do some thrifting, we take some buggy rides, and we get to know one another and share our ideas. I would love to do something like this, but I need help organizing. This is also something new to me. So if this is something that you love doing, please reach out to me. I really want us to all get together. And I'm also open to other locations, but I just have to say, Bird in Hand is great because we can do most of the events right here in my house and yard. And, you know, Brenda can hold an autograph session for all of you. And speaking of getting to know one another, Carrie, the executive editor of Closehorse.world, and I are working on an episode for May that will talk about my journey to making Close Horse, why I am passionate about changing the way we get dressed, and why, I mean, let's get down to brass tacks, I've basically ended my career in the industry in favor of doing the right thing. It feels super weird to talk about myself like that for a whole hour. (laughs) Uh, That's just not who I am. But Amy of the Velvet Underground kind of planted the seed in my mind when I answered her questions for Women Wednesday a few weeks ago. She said something like, you know, you should share your story with the community on the blog or the podcast. I think people would love to learn more about you. And I was at first like, oh, would people want to? That seems so embarrassing. But Carrie thinks it's a good idea, and she is a very level-headed Virgo, so if Carrie says it's good, then it's a good idea. So if you have a question for me, please call the Close Horse Hotline and leave a message. It will help us shape the episode, so it would be great if you could call in the next two weeks. The hotline number is 717-925-7417. 
I'll probably say it another time in this episode, but it's also always in the show notes. And you can also do the hot new popular thing that all the cool kids are doing, which is record a voice memo on your phone or computer and email it to me. It's up to you, however you feel the most comfortable. Before we jump into this episode, I just want to remind you, if you're interested in supporting my work on Close Horse via Patreon, you can find out more at patreon.com slash Close Horse Podcast. And I just want to let you all know that this month's Patreon exclusive episode of Close Horse will be about Hello Kitty, a subject that you know I love, um, but also Hello Kitty as a massive consumerist moment. It's actually really really perfect for consumption month here at close horse if patreon's not your thing you can also send a direct donation via venmo to at crystal underscore visions i'm so grateful for any support any of you send my way it's so meaningful thank you as always to all of you who already have contributed who leave reviews on apple podcasts who share our posts on instagram and most importantly just keep listening because i know i'm eating up a lot of your time <laughs> All right. Well, we have so much to do. First off, Tatum sent me a message in response to my conversation, I think it was two episodes ago, with Elise of Nyliner about the stigma against reusing packaging on Poshmark. And she has some really good advice for all of us who are secretly hoarding boxes and mailers in our closet. I, You can't see me, but I'm very slowly raising my hand very awkwardly. I... I'm a packaging hoarder. I can't help it. She says, good morning. I just had a quick note after listening to the Depop segment on your recent podcast. I resell my children's clothes on Poshmark, not as a career like your guest, but mostly because I know they'll be getting reused if someone buys them, even if it's cheap. In my profile, I wrote that buying secondhand is sustainable and that whenever possible, I will ship in repurposed packaging. I also include a thank you note that says something like, thank you for choosing secondhand and preserving the earth for our children. Obviously, this works best since it's children's clothes, and that is why I have carefully packaged your purchases in reused packaging. I think by doing this, it kind of makes people think twice before they complain about any reused packaging. This is excellent advice, Tatum. As I mentioned when I was talking to Elise, I always reuse packaging, and most of the time, no one has said anything unpleasant or untoward about it, but every once in a while, someone is kind of annoyed about it. And, you know, I think I was just coming into Poshmark very naively thinking like, oh, this is about sustainability, but that's actually not what Poshmark is about, as you know by now. And Poshmark itself is literally selling its own Poshmark branded packaging, including, you know, tissue and mailers and stickers and whatnot. So it's not a reusable packaging situation per se, but I do like this strategy of just calling out that you're reusing packaging. Tell them in advance before the purchase and thank them again when they purchase. <laughs> I think it's always nice to sort of congratulate the buyer for saving the planet because they might not be even thinking about all of the packaging waste that happens every day on this planet. And this is just another way that we can reach people who aren't thinking about that and kind of plant that seed in their minds. So I, I love this idea. It reminds me of those little cards in hotel bathrooms that tell you that you, yes, you, can save the planet just by reusing your towels. I can't remember if I've talked about this in the past, but those little towel signs are actually considered the first use of greenwashing marketing in the noble history of greenwashing. <laughs> okay, next we have a call from Amy of the Velvet Underground, and she has another great idea for us. Hey Amanda, it's Amy here from the Velvet Underground in Whistler, Canada, finally calling in to the Close Horse Hotline. Um, I was listening to the episodes on mending the other day and it got me thinking about something that's kind of been on my mind for a little while and that is the price of alterations and repairs and mending and things like that. I have a friend who just a couple of doors down who has an alteration business as well. And we were chatting about how much people kick up a fuss when, you know, they find out the price of something. And 
it's um, because a lot of people don't understand the work that goes into altering things, repairing things, because, you know, as you said, you often have to take the whole thing apart and then like reverse engineer it back together. And it's a lot of work and a lot of skill involved in doing that. And, you know, it's really hard sometimes for people to justify uh, spending $30 to get a zipper replaced when the jacket costs 20 And I get it from a financial perspective, but it really sucks for the environment. So, and the other thing is too, it's not just clothes that this happens to. It's all across the board. And I think a big one for this is electrical appliances. The other day I was at the tip or the dump, I guess, and it was just a graveyard of um, everything from TVs to microwaves, washing machines, dishwashers, dryers, um, small appliances, whatever, you name it, it was there. And it was just so heartbreaking to see and I understand like how it happens because these things cost so much money to get repaired and then it's honestly just cheaper to buy a new one so that's what people do and yeah it really sucks so I was thinking wouldn't it be cool if the government like subsidized repairs and mending and things like that somehow whether it was like I don't know tax deductible or it should definitely be tax free that's for sure um or I don't know it just if the government recognized that it was you know a big step forward to I'm sure it's it's definitely not the full solution to um things getting thrown out and ending up in landfill but it would definitely help and yeah then they incentivized businesses and people, consumers and customers to get things repaired rather than buy things new. But um, yeah, that's just my two cents. I don't know if any of the listeners have any information on how the hell you would even get something like that made into a real thing. I'm sure there's like so much red tape involved with anything to do with the government, but it would be cool and yeah, we can dream. Anyway, thanks for listening to my rant and hopefully I will speak to you again soon. Bye. So much like Amy, I fully believe that there's no way we can change the sheer volume of waste that our countries are generating every year without government intervention. I would love for the government to subsidize repairs of electronics, clothing, you name it, too many items go to the landfill, like Amy said, because they're too expensive to repair or at least a new version of whatever it is can be purchased for the same amount or less. Where's the incentive to repair, right? And we don't want to pay the people doing the repairs less. Like we don't want to make repairs less expensive for the people doing them because it's highly skilled labor that deserves a good wage. The same goes for alterations too. I, I know that that happens because people don't understand how complicated sewing is because so few people know how to sew, but it's still, it still really pushes my buttons. All in all, governments must step in to create and enforce policy around EPR, which we've talked about here way back in January with Jess of Fab Scrap. EPR stands for Extended Producer Responsibility, which means producers of products are responsible for product disposal at the end of that product's life. That end of life, meaning the point at which the products are designated as no longer useful by customers, like by us, not by the manufacturer. This is an amazing policy idea across the board, but there are three major areas where this is really being discussed very heavily, and none of them will surprise you. The first one is plastics. And EPR for plastics would mean that plastics producers would be responsible for the collection and recycling of plastic that they produce and place into the market. This could be a specific percentage of you know what they manufacture each year, like maybe they're required to collect and recycle 10% of what they create every year. I mean, that that number is way too low. But, you know, for example, it could also mean that they would be required to recycle a volume of plastic each year that equals the amount of new plastic they're making. This like sort of 
net zero of plastics. That's the dream situation right here. Doesn't exist at all, like not even close to it. But this is another great thing to start demanding from our politicians because, you know, I'm riled up about plastic every day. Another area is electronics. EPR for electronics would entail electronics manufacturers from Apple to Sony to all of the like 900 brands of televisions out there. They would be responsible for collecting all products at the end of life and properly disassembling them and recycling them. It goes without saying that when cell phones and I don't, do people even have DVD players anymore? I, I don't know. We'll just say when cell phones, laptops, you know, printers and televisions go into the landfill or just go into the regular trash, it's so bad. Like if you think polyester clothes are just leaching horrible chemicals into the environment, well, you haven't met electronics yet. So there's a lot of incentive here to rein in the electronics industry in this way because you know, maybe you're not the person who buys a new phone every time it comes out. But let me tell you, there is an epidemic of fast electronics out there, you know, from Fitbits, Apple Watches, iPhones, all kinds of other gaming related accoutrement. These things come in and out of people's lives pretty fast, but they are not, they're not great to throw away, you know, but repairing them often is more expensive than just replacing them. So this would also mean that these brands could not, you know, they could go beyond recycling and they could actually refurbish them and sell them as used. This happens a lot. You know, Apple definitely does that, but not even close to nearly as often as it should. The next area where EPR is so important is textiles. So that would mean clothing, home goods, you know, anything made of fabric. This would mean that all fast fashion brands would be required to collect all of the clothes when we are finished with them, and then they would have to recycle them. I think, as a person who comes from inside the industry and knows how cheap that industry is, I think if this became a law, if EPR was a real policy that was enforced, we would see a massive shift in the quality of clothing we're currently being sold. Because collecting, sorting, disassembling, and recycling clothing is very, very expensive. It would actually be cheaper for the industry to just make better stuff in the first place, honestly. For the electronics industry, a solid EPR policy would mean that it would be in their best interest financially to make repairs more accessible and possibly even free of charge. And I'm not really sure what to say about the plastics industry, except that maybe they would get better at recycling technology. These are all things to think about. I do want to round out this little segment here with one last fun fact about EPR, and it's a very promising one. France, which I've talked about in the past here and their EPR policy, they are the only country in the world with an EPR law for textiles, including clothing. They have achieved a 35% recovery rate of unwanted clothing, and they aim to continue to grow this year over year. I know 2019's goal was 50%. I don't know what's happening in the pandemic world around EPR in France, but nearly 60% of the clothing, linens, and footwear collected is actually reused, and less than 1% of it is sent to the landfill. And it doesn't cost the taxpayers a dime because... The manufacturers of the clothing and textiles and footwear are required to cover the cost of recovery and you know, distribution, anything else that needs to happen. That's amazing. Well, we don't have time to dilly-dally, but please keep thinking about EPR. So next, let's meet Susan Massey. Now, last week, World published an amazing story from Susan about how she blew the proverbial whistle on some very unsafe and very unsavory conditions at her workplace. And I found her essay so inspiring because there have been so many times in my life that I have wanted to do something like that. But, you know, I've never done anything about it because, to be honest, I've just been too afraid of retaliation and or losing my job. So her story makes me believe that doing the right thing in that kind of situation can actually, well, result in a happy ending. 
So please check it out. I'll share a link to it in the show notes. Susan is here to tell us about some of the unethical or, I don't know, uncool stuff she has experienced as a vintage seller. And let me tell you, in the past few weeks, actually since I recorded this conversation with Susan, I have received so many similar stories from vintage sellers all over the world in my DMs on Instagram. So it means, perhaps not surprisingly, that just because a business is small or doing something sustainable like selling secondhand clothing doesn't mean that the person running it is ethical or nice. If you have a story about your experiences selling and sourcing vintage, send it my way. I want to talk to you. Okay, let's meet Susan. Hi, my name is Susan Massey. Um, I was born and raised in Detroit, and I currently live in Oakland, California. I've been here for about a little over 15 years. And I've been wearing and collecting vintage clothing since about 1989. <laughs> wow. So you know what you are talking about. I, I like to think so. <laughs> So you, uh, you know, I was like putting the call out there like, hey, does anybody have stories about secondhand or their experiences in it? And you reached out and you said, you know, you've seen some sketchy stuff out there. In- I have. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, and I've also, in addition to wearing it and collecting it for all these years, I've also been selling vintage um, at a couple local shops here for the last three years, a little over three years. And um Prior to that, I had, when I was in college in the early 90s, there were a couple of vintage stores in the Detroit area. One was called Cinderella's Attic, and, you know, any Detroiters uh, will probably remember that. And another one was called It Was, It Is, and that was kind of around the corner from Cinderella's Attic. But I used to buy, when I found really good vintage clothing at thrift stores um, back then, I would take it home, wash it and mend it if it needed it, and then go take it to the vintage stores, and I was kind of like a, a middle girl instead of a middleman. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the the owner of Cinderella's Attic was named Heidi, and she was very, very sweet. And she was, you know, I knew her for a, a long, long time. And um, she was always excited when I would bring stuff in for her. And, um you know, she would pay me cash for things and, you know, and then turn around and resell it. It was just really fun. And I I hadn't done that in a long time. And then I had an opportunity to start selling vintage again. And I I really love it. But yeah, unfortunately, I have seen some unethical things go down. So tell us about it, because we talk all the time on the show, like, don't give your money to assholes. And I think it's really important to remember that assholes are everywhere. Yeah, that is (laughs) Oh my gosh, that is the unfortunate truth of it, you know. It really and I, is. And it we're really all is. we're all talking these days about, you know, shop local, support small businesses, so on and so forth. And I, you know, since I've moved out to the Bay Area years ago, I've mostly worked for local smaller businesses and, you know, not just in vintage but in general retail and um you know, there's been a lot of like unsavory kind of stuff going on. And I think what happens there is, unfortunately, when somebody has a little bit of power, they just kind of take advantage. No matter what the industry is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so then it gets, you know, it gets to the point where, like, you're constantly advocating for yourself and um, being met with resistance. And it's just like, oh, geez. And when I do find... Um, people that have really good business practices, I think it's important to just hype the hell out of them mm-hmm. and, you know, bring them as much business as possible. And there, unfortunately, there are a lot of really good people out there who, you know, really are investing in their communities and, you know, keeping everything on the up and up and just, you know, so that's important. So I don't want it to seem like, oh, everyone sucks, you know, you can't, <laughs> you know. People love to say, oh, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of bad behavior, but I, I don't think that everyone is completely corrupt. And- <laughs> no, no. You know, in every industry, there are good people, there are bad people. I actually receive messages occasionally from people who are like secondhand or vintage sellers who are really concerned 
Mm-hmm. People are coming at them with that, like, well, you must be a monster too because you're supporting capitalism. And like, yeah. why, are you, why are you selling stuff from the thrift store? And I'm like, well, actually, you're doing like a really major service. Yeah. Because otherwise, that stuff is probably going to end up in a landfill ultimately. Exactly. And you have covered so much of that. And I think it's really important for people to know, you know, you're, you're educating people. Oh my gosh. I mean, I've learned so much listening to your podcast about what happens at thrift stores, you know, with stuff that doesn't get purchased or doesn't even get out on the the sales floor. And I mean, it's mind boggling. So, I mean, you are doing something good when you're reselling vintage, you know, or you're buying it or whatever. Also, like something that you've had a couple guests touch on that are vintage sellers is it's a, you know, it's a lot more work than what the average Joe might realize. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had people say that to me where they're like, oh, you know, you just go to thrift stores and buy stuff and then turn around and sell it for, what, 10 times the price? I'm like, dude, I am spending sometimes like three, four hours in oh. the thrift store, Yeah. you know. Yeah. No. And then I, you know, yeah. And then I you know, take it home and go over everything with a fine-tooth comb and, you know, spruce up the garments, clean them, do the stain treatment, mend them. You know, I have one of those awesome sweater shavers that I'm constantly using. You know, and that all goes, factors into the price, along with how old it is, how rare it is. Vintage reselling is a lot, it's a lot of work and it's a labor of love. It is, it is. And it's not, I mean, if you've ever gone thrifting, you don't yeah. just walk in there and immediately, like, there, right there on the rack is, is the gem and then you go pay for it. And go right. Home. It's like you were saying, it's like hours. You uh-huh. might go all day and find nothing. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I have really good thrifting mojo, and I always have. I feel like that's just one of the things. I don't know if it's because I'm a double Taurus or what, but <laughs> <laughs> I just, seriously, I don't know. I mean, you know, the the whole, like, phrase of Taurus is I have. So apparently, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm good, and we're we're into like material, good, like really nice material goods. So apparently, like I'd like to think that that's just working in my favor when <laughs> when it comes to thrift. I don't know, but anyway, um, you know, I'm always able to find something. I'm always able to find, you know, a handful of stuff at least. Um, one of the things that I absolutely love about reselling is that um, I'm, you know, I've always been like plus size or, you know, small fat, however you want to say it. I'm about, like, right now I'm like a 12, 14, 16, depending. Um, But I've always been, I've been, like, much, much bigger. Um, So a lot of times I would go thrifting and, like, the true vintage stuff that I would find, especially, like, back in the 90s when I was at my heaviest, like, in the mid-90s, you know, I'd find all this beautiful stuff and then I I was like, okay, well, I've got to leave this here, you know, these beautiful, like, 70s striped bell bottoms that are like a size four you know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can admire them and then you know for two dollars because it's 1996 and <laughs> that's the way it was back then but now when I find those gems I can buy them and then you know and then someone else will buy them for me and then they will be so excited and so happy and then that makes me really excited and happy in return and I just, I, that's one of the things I love about it. And, you know, when I find something um, that's really great, that's not my size, I love picturing who's going to wear it, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. who's going to, who it's going to go to. And, you know, that, that just brings me so much joy. And that's the thing about thrifting, you know, and reselling is that, um you're doing all that work. You're doing all that searching and digging and, and treasure hunting. You know, and I think that, yes, it's a lot of work, but, you know, for those of us that are into it, like, we do get a charge from it. You know, it it does feel really good. So one of the things that I have noticed um, in the first shop that I worked in out here was that, and I've noticed this too, like looking at vintage sellers on Instagram sometimes or Etsy, is that someone will mislabel an era of something. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes it is not done intentionally. I think that, um, and I did notice that um, with one of my colleagues at the first shop I was working at here is that things were mislabeled pretty frequently. Um, and the the gal that was 
the seller um, was very young and was kind of a, you know, kind of a hipster, normcore sort of gal. She was very, very sweet. And I think she just didn't know. You know, yeah, and it, yeah. it, would, it would be really easy for me to come in with 30 plus years of, you know, experience in, in it and be like, oh, my God, why, you know, well, she doesn't know, you know, and so much stuff that's been made over, you know, so many clothing items that have been made over the last like 15, 20 years, they're done in retro styles. And if you don't know what to look for in fabric and zippers and buttons and labels and, you know, and everything else it's going to be really difficult, you know? Totally, totally. I mean, I think that that's a really good point. And, you know, working on the other side of it, like working for all these mass retailers, we are almost exclusively developing from vintage samples, Mm -hmm. unless it's something we're overtly stealing from another brand. But like, (laughs) it it is, I mean, I, even I, as a person who has worked with clothing for a long time, I will get tripped up at, at, thrift stores where I like really have to look and yeah like, I do is too this 20s or is this 80s or yeah is this early aughts you know like because right. these things are so cyclical too right and now see the thing is the, the you know doing like the cyclical styles like that's been going on for decade upon decade upon decade and I mean my god I love a 70s does 40s look or a mm-hmm. 90s you know mm-hmm. 90s does 40s or 80s does 30s or whatever but, you know, um, yeah, I, I still go, like, I was just out hunting on Saturday night, and um, I was doing what I like to call supermarket sweep, where I don't have, a, you know, I go in when I don't have, like, I give myself maybe an hour. And uh-huh. just like, let me see what I can find, uh-huh. you know. I always find stuff, but, the, you know, flipping through the racks, it's like, oh, what is this? Oh, it's from Forever 21. Oh, what's oh this? My oh, God, it's from, dude. oh, it's from I Old Navy. Been, it's you know? like the name of my biography. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Oh, what's you know? Wow. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, and in addition to loving vintage clothing, I've, you know, ever since I was a child, like early, early childhood, my mom was, re- my mom was a really big fashion plate in Detroit in the, you know, in the sixties and seventies. And, you know, even now she's really into clothes, but, um, you know, she, um, she was very chic and stylish, like when she and my dad were dating in the early sixties. And so she's always, you know, she's always told me about, she always remembers like what she wore for everything and looking at old pictures and stuff. I mean, she, you know, she looked like she could have stepped off the set of Mad Men or something. I mean, it was just, so she taught me a lot about, you know, vintage clothing, particularly from the sixties and seventies. And I learned, I learned more, more and more over the years, but, um, so I've always loved fashion. I've always loved fashion and style and, you know, I've always paid attention to fashion. Um, when I, you know, for years, when I, from the time I was a teenager till, you know, I left Michigan, I, subscribe to a lot of fashion magazines that are, you know, no longer around, like uh, Nylon and Lucky and, you know, things like that. Um, Even with music, it's like I always, you know, I I always loved Sonic Youth, and I always was paying attention to what Kim Gordon was wearing and, Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. I worked at a cosmetics counter in a small department store in Berkeley for almost 10 years, and we mostly sold juniors clothing. And, you know, the the cosmetics counter was kind of, like, right in the middle of the juniors department. So I would see stuff all the – you know, I would look at the clothes all the time and see what was coming in. So you notice, like, different – like, different little design flourishes where it tells you how old something is. You know, um, for example – or the type of fabric, you know. But, for example, like, something that I get tripped up on that – is, you know, I'll find a dress or something, and then there's a big-ass zipper up the back. I'm like, oh, this is from 2012. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes it is confusing. Even if you know a lot about fabric or label mm-hmm. or brands, sometimes you have to, like, really, really think about it because it can be misleading. I don't know. It's not as simple as it used to be to right. find find stuff. I did work with someone who a few times confided in me that they had, you know, they'd mislabeled stuff because they were like, oh, the customers don't know any difference. I was like, that's a bummer. 
that's not cool. You know, like they would yeah. take the, they would take the label out and then say that it was from the eighties. I'm like, you know, and I didn't say anything at the time because I was like, well, it's none of my business. You know, we were all kind of like working for ourselves there, like collectively, if that made sense. But I, you know, I would never want to do something like that. You know, it's, I, even, you know, even with all my experience with vintage, like, like I say, I still get confused sometimes. And my motto when I'm out fighting, you know, hunting for stuff is if I can't figure out the era, then I'm just going to leave it here because I don't want to take the chance of buying something and labeling it like 80s, you know, new wave top or whatever. And it actually turns out it was from Fashion Nova, but the person ripped the label out. And, yeah, you know, yeah, um, totally. And I really, like, that really bothered me to see that. And it's like, well, you're kind of, you're charging sort of a lot for these items. And you're basically saying, like, oh, well, the customer doesn't know any better. And, you know, that wasn't cool. I mean, I always label the era. And if I can decipher that it's, like, early 70s or, you know, like, late 80s or whatever, I always put that on there because I think, you know, if someone doesn't know themselves when it's from, they're going to learn. You know, mm-hmm, by looking mm-hmm. at the little, by looking at the tag that I've made, and you know, that makes it even cooler for them and more special. Yeah. I like to think of the person wearing it and getting a compliment, and then saying, "Oh, you know, this is from the late '80s." It- <laughs> <laughs> I love that too. Yeah, one of the coolest things about vintage clothing is you're—I mean, you're literally wearing history. You know, yeah, and yeah. I love that. Another issue I had was I had to learn, like when I when I went back into selling about three years ago at this particular shop. I was mostly coming in with my own, with my own stuff. Like I hadn't gone out and bought anything. I basically just cleaned out my own closet Mm -hmm. and I had tons and tons of true vintage. It was a lot of like uh, fifties, forties, fifties and early sixties stuff like dresses and skirts. And it was plus size and it was stuff that I just had changed, you know, changed my style up a little bit or I, you know, lost a little bit of weight or whatever. So I was like, great. I already have all this stuff to get started with. Well, um, that wasn't what was selling there so much, which is fine. I had to retrain my eye and, you know, pay attention and see what was selling. And when I would go out and look for stuff, you know, look for things that I might not necessarily wear myself, which is cool because it was a big learning experience. But one of my colleagues would, um, you know, who also sold rare, true vintage stuff um, on Etsy and at another store in another city in the Bay Area, she would look at, you know, what I was bringing in and she'd be like, oh, that's really beautiful. That dress is beautiful, but no one's going to buy that here. Mm. And I was like, you don't need to tell me that. Let's see if it, you know, and my attitude yeah. was like, yeah, well, let's see about that, you know. <laughs> And then it's kind of like, well, that's up to me to figure that out and figure out what to do with this item if it doesn't sell because we were on a three-month cycle. Um, And then what she was doing was buying stuff from me, using her employee discount, and then reselling it on her Etsy for way more. And Uh, I've heard about this happening. Yeah. I mean, not like it happens all the time, but they're just – Assholes among us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I got, you know, it was really ticking me off. I mean, it was only, and the thing is, it was only a 20% discount. So it was more the principle of it. And mm-hmm. it's like, you don't know if I'm not going to turn around and maybe start my own website or something. Like you could at least ask me, you know, like the discount at that shop was put into place so that the staff could buy stuff from each other to wear because we were all constantly bringing in cute stuff you know and it was kind of like just like a little courtesy discount so we could all kind of you know enhance our own wardrobes and you know sometimes sometimes we would trade things with each other yeah you know for equal value which was nice um so I felt like she knew that and you know she knew that what she was doing was wrong and sneaky um (laughs) On a side note, I, um, my therapist actually sold vintage clothing when she was in college, like worked at a vintage shop in the 80s. 
And her jaw dropped when I told her that. And she said, oh, my God. If She said, granted, it's a different world now with e-commerce. She said, but mm-hmm. if we would have been buying stuff from each other at, in order to re- resell it, she said, you would have been fired for that because it's just sneaky. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely, it's like another thing that, it's a, we, you know, we talk about this a lot on the pod. It's like, yeah, technically it's not illegal, but it's mm-hmm. super unethical. And why would yeah. you let what's legal or not legal determine what's wrong or right. Like, it's wrong. Yeah. Well, and then when it comes down to that, it's like, you got to stop and remember, like, some of the stuff that was, in fact, legal in this country once upon a time and is no longer because it's horribly unethical and inhumane, you know. And I'm not trying to – I'm not trying to say, like, reselling vintage, you know, buying vintage at a discount to resell at a profit is, you know, the same as – not allowing certain ethnic groups to vote or anything. I'm definitely not that, but I'm just saying, you know, like legal doesn't always mean right, you know. Um, <laughs> but so I, I confronted her about this and I, I, you know, didn't want to come off as too aggressive, but I said, you know, if you're going to buy stuff to resell for me, I would prefer that you ask me so I can decide. And then, if I'm fine with it, like, please buy it without the discount. I said, you know, it's fine if you want to, like, PayPal me or pay me cash without the tax or whatever. We can do it that way. But, you know, mm-hmm. if you're buying it to resell it, please don't take the employee discount. And Yeah, that is so effed up. I'm sorry. That makes me so angry. Yeah. You know? Like, because the employee discount is taking money out of your pocket, right? Right. Exactly. So, like, if you're going to resell it, if you pay full price to you, like, who cares, right? Fine. Whatever you want to go do, but don't, like, also short you. I, it, I'm, like, getting upset, and this isn't even happening right now. <laughs> I'm, like, upset for you. <laughs> well, and the thing is that when I would bring this stuff in and she would say, oh, that's really gorgeous, but no one's going to buy that hair, I felt like she was kind of, she was kind of planting the seed, you know, to get me to think, oh, well, I'm just glad to have you take it off by hand. No, I mean, I, and that's the thing, like, she is someone who definitely has a lot of vintage experience, but so do I. Like, you're just assuming that I don't know any better, but as a matter of fact, I do, you know? Yeah. And even if I didn't, even if I just had woken up that morning and was like, oh, I'm going to go work at the shop and sell vintage, don't take advantage of somebody, like, you know, in that way. Um. So I, I brought, I said, you know, just let me know, ask me about a particular piece, and then, you know, if we do decide that I'm fine with you buying it, just pay – if you could pay the full price, that would be awesome if you're going to resell it. And she just blew a gasket, and she's like, why are you getting upset about this? And I was like, I I just feel like it's very unethical for you to buy this stuff from me at a discount and then sell it, resell it at a profit. And she's like, how can you make this about morals when you're going to the Salvation Army in Thrift Town and buying stuff Ooh, for you? Not the same. Not and that was what same. I told her. I said, <laughs> that's different. Okay, this is like I went out and found this stuff. And then, you know, when you're doing this with me, you're actually screwing over your colleague. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, I'm not going in. To the Salvation Army and saying, you know what, I've come in here for three months and I've seen that dress on the rack. Why don't you give it to me at a discount? No, I pay whatever's on the price tag because I know I'm going to resell it. And I, you know, I adjust the price accordingly. And she just kept arguing with me about it. And she's like, well, I guess you'd rather just have your stuff sitting there for three months on the rack and then, you know, just sitting in your apartment. I said, you don't know that it's sitting in my apartment if it doesn't sell here. Yeah. And then she was saying, like, you know what? I'm not going to buy anything from you anymore if I can't have the discount because I can't afford it. And I said, it's 20%. Really, this is more about the principle of it. You know, if you don't want to buy anything from me again to resell, that's fine. You know, and then she put it in the group text because she was expecting everyone else that sold there to co-sign with her. And then everyone was like, why have you been doing that with my stuff? Why would you do that? And, you know, someone else brought up the point. They said, that's just lazy. Because the other person put in all the legwork to get that piece and bring it into the shop and maybe mend it or wash it or whatever and, you know, set the price accordingly, and then you're just going to turn around and buy it. That's not cool. So, thankfully, that kind of that kind of nipped it in the bud, and she stopped doing it. She didn't buy anything again from me for a long time, which was fine. And then after a few months, she was like – 
you know, you've had this in the shop for three months. It's coming to the end. Would you mind if I bought it? To re-? I was like, yeah, you know, whatever it was. And, you know, and then she just paid for it at the price that I had. So I was like, okay, good, you know. But I feel like that was just such shady behavior to begin with. And then to try to turn around and be like, you're attacking me or I can't afford to pay the full price. It's like, give me a break. I feel like this happens a lot, though. Like, not yeah. all the time, but a lot of my friends who sell vintage in different places like that, where it's like a group of sellers, mm-hmm. they have they have frustrating stories like that. Yeah. I am friends with this really awesome group of women here in the East Bay that all sell vintage. And um, before the quarantine, we were doing pop-ups, which were so much fun. And sometimes if we had st- – one of the gals would have the pop-ups. They would. They were this really big fun event that she would have at um, the apartment building she lived at. Like had a really big backyard and driveway, so we would have them there, and it was just a blast. We would all kind of use it as like a blowout sale for whatever we had left, you know, that hadn't sold in other places, and we were selling stuff for pretty cheap. And a lot of times at the end of the sale. If we had stuff left over that we just did not want to pack up or deal with anymore, we would ask each other, like, hey, do you want this? Do you, you know, do you want this sweater? Do you want this blouse? And, you know, kind of swap stuff with each other. And then if we ended up reselling it, that's fine. But it was kind of like, you know, we're all just kind of mixing and matching. And I don't know, like that, that was really fun. And I felt like that was something that was done um, on, you know, it was all very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> There's always going to be a bad apple in everything. Much as you can't assume everybody who works at a corporate job is a monster, you can also mm-hmm. assume that everybody who sells secondhand or, you know, does something else that's, like, sustainable is a great person with great ethics, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And the last thing I've noticed, which is not really unethical, but it's something that just kind of grinds my gears a <laughs> <laughs> is... When people are very, very secretive, sellers are very secretive to other sellers about where they get their stuff from. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I – this is one of those things <laughs> because I have I, I have a lot of different friends who sell vintage or secondhand in different ways, and some of them are, like, really, like, open and, like, will take you places and whatnot, and other mm-hmm. people are just, like, I'm sorry, I can't reveal that. Like, so, <laughs> and so, I mean, and I, res- you know, I respect both sides of it, but I know that it is a fiercely competitive field. Yeah. And I have to say, after being a vintage hunter and collector for, you know, 30 plus years, um, I don't think it needs to be competitive. There's enough to go around. We're all, you know, a lot of times mm-hmm. we're, we're looking for different stuff. Right. You know, right. we all kind of have. You know, we all kind of have our specialties, and I feel like there is there is enough to go around for everybody, yeah. you know. There's yeah. an, and I, you had a guest who had this wonderful idea of, like, teaching people how to vintage shop. Yes, Jennifer. Man, I love that idea because – I right? love it, too. I would love to take on a vintage apprentice. And I know. <laughs> me, too. I'm already trying to think about, like, how we can organize that because I think – we basically we need to connect people who are experts with people in their area who aren't experts and like have them go out. I think if you've never been thrifting before, it is so intimidating. Yeah. And especially sure, nowadays. Oh my gosh, for sure. And also like, you know, there are different types of thrifting. Like, right. Like if you go to the bins and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to have a terrible time. Or if you right. do like an, a state sale or an auction, you're not going to understand that either. And so right. I am obsessed with this idea of different people in our community teaching other people how to do these things. So definitely something I want to make happen. I'm trying to figure out how we can do it, but I think it would be so incredible. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and my friends that I've done the, that I've done the pop-ups with, um, one of them is I'll I'll say their names and you can put it in if you want to or not. But one of them is um, her name's Haley and she does curvy girl vintage. Mm-hmm. Um, she's awesome. I just adore her. And then another gal is her name's Vita, and she does jewelry and art as well. And that's under Vita Vasquez Studio, I think. Her uh, vintage is 
aqua aqua tahe thrift i think it's a, it's spanish for avocado but i i know i'm just going to butcher the hell out of it if i'm not actually <laughs> looking at it but um both of them po- focus on plus size stuff and everything is like bright vibrant colorful they both are really great at styling like vita and Haley, like they both model a lot of their own stuff and we're always sharing information you know with each other and we're always like we're always helping each other out like as much as we can you know um which we have to do virtually during the pandemic but oh my god like i oh it's that is just such a good feeling this kind of like really sweet like sisterhood and you know selling vintage and uh Haley and I were talking about taking a little road trip at some point to go thrifting and I said you know I I really believe that you know there's enough to go around and she said yeah there absolutely is you know ah, definitely there have been times in my life when I have been like really really um you know, just broke, broke as a joke. And I, I, you know, like we were talking before, I grew up very working class. So it, in a lot of regards, I have a lot of like issues around money and whatnot that I'm working through. So it, um, I tend to have like a scarcity mentality that I'm really working on right now. Um, but with the thrifting stuff, I've always, like I say, I've always had really good thrifting mojo. And I, I just like, I'm like, no, there's, there's an abundance. There is enough for everyone. We don't need to hoard mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we don't need to – I don't feel like among, like, sellers that are friends with each other or colleagues or whatever, I don't feel that we need to hide information from each other. You know, thrifting has changed so much since I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And oh, as, for sure. as far as what's out there and who goes thrifting and who, um, you know, what what we do with it, you know – um, cause there was, I mean, there was no internet when I started thrifting in 1989, <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's, yeah. And there was, there was a ton, you know, there's always a ton of vintage, um, you still have to dig through a lot of crap and, you know, stuff that maybe you didn't want or most people didn't want. Um, but with fast fashion and, and you talk about that so much, you know, I'm concerned what thrifting is going to be like in another 10 years oh and God. what is it what's going to be popular in another 10 years because right now early 2000s stuff is coming around and there's a lot of really cute well-made stuff from that time you know you have to dig for it like everything mm-hmm, else but mm-hmm. um you know 10 years from now I'm just like what are, are people going to be wearing is it going to be really chic to wear like old H&M stuff that I mean dude I think about this all the time and I'm sure so do a lot of the listeners because I'm like you know the thing that I keep reading more and more as I dig into this more is that like for the most part those clothes aren't even desirable on the in the secondhand market overseas because the quality is so low right. but theoretically knowing that almost all clothing that's made right now has become fast fashion at least like the most widely available clothing right mm-hmm. that's what's going to end up in thrift stores are people going to buy that? Like, I, I have so many questions, too. It will be really intriguing to see what happens. What I'll say is that I have seen how the appetite around vintage and the trends in it are really dictated what, by, like, what's readily available. So I remember in the aughts, you would see mm-hmm. a lot of, like, 90s clothes, and, like, nobody wanted that, right? It was like, oh, God, right. yeah. well, it's hard to wear that. But, like, then around 2010, <clears throat> 2015, that was really cool and desirable, which is good because there was plenty of it. Uh, my guess, I mean, actually, and I'll just say this, in the early aughts, what was desirable for a lot of people was 80s stuff. But when you mm-hmm. saw that thrifting in the 90s, it was like far, yes. right? Does that mean, like, in 2030, we're going to all be really stoked on, yeah, like H&M? I don't know. I'm, oh. I'm really, I. it's hard for me to say because the other thing, despite how, like, trend focused all these retailers are as a person who's worked in the industry for so long I have seen in the past few years that everybody's selling the same thing over and over again and nobody's willing to take any risks or do something different and so I think it would be even hard to say like what 2020 looks like from a trend perspective yeah it could be like this is what the 70s were like this is the 80s this is the 90s yeah 
I don't know what you say the last 10 years has been aesthetically. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, Susan. All of you listeners are missing no less than 15 minutes of conversation about cats, which I edited out. um, And that did include Brenda's origin story. I just wasn't sure if you would want to hear all that cat talk. Maybe we'll save that for some like bonus, like, you know, anniversary content or something. (laughs) Um, I do want to say that I would love to hear more from all of you vintage purveyors out there because it's it's not an easy job and I feel like you deal with a lot of, pardon my French, bullshit. How do you feel about sharing your sources? Do you like to keep it top secret? Uh, I would love to know why you do or do not do that. I want to hear about some other unethical or uncool things you've encountered. And for the rest of you thriftaholics, who wants to volunteer for the thrifting apprentice program? I I just love that idea so much. I don't know how to make it happen, but maybe we need a test case to figure it out. And Susan's basically already volunteered. So is there a newbie out there who wants to apprentice with Susan? You know, drop me a line. Okay, next, we're going to hear a just uh, so delightful conversation with Close Horse All-Star Jem and her father, Mr. Masland. Mr. Masland is legendary within our group of friends for his impeccable style, and he has some very provocative ideas about bow ties, among other things. He also has some great advice about personal style. So let's just get right into it. So... Usually how we start these interviews is the subject can introduce themselves. Um, Would you like to start by saying who you are and talking a little bit about your relationship with menswear, just an overview? Yes, my name is Bob Maslin. I'm a 71-year-old man who probably uh, first uh, entered the world of uh, what we call menswear when I was about eight years old and went off to summer camp and was officially outfitted with uh, a uniform so that we would uh, be able to run around in the woods of Maine. Uh, One of the features was a a pair of moccasins with wool athletic socks to keep the mosquitoes out. I don't know if that happened or not. When I was 12, I I bought clothes on the third floor. uh, I didn't buy them. My father bought them at Brooks Brothers to get outfitted for St. Mark's School, a prep school in Southboro, connected Southboro, Massachusetts. Uh, basically, there was a whole room of tables with, with flannels and chinos and loafers, and that's pretty much how a young man was outfitted to go to prep school. I uh, later went to Yale College, which at one time was the epicenter of the, uh, of the uh, young college Ivy League look, However, I attended beginning in the fall of 68, and I think at that point they had eliminated coat and tie, and all of a sudden it was the 60s, and uh, menswear sort of <laughs> went more to blue jeans and uh, and uh, T-shirts. So it was a sort of a troubled time. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, had a very low draft number, went into the U.S. Army as a private back in, in 1972 and was outfitted with uh, a whole kit of uh, fatigues, uh, khakis, uniforms, et cetera, et cetera, for my, my two years there. I got out in 74, and uh, there was a recession. Uh, Nixon was out of office, and I really couldn't find a job, so I took a part-time job working for a clothing store that turned into a full-time job on Newbury Street in Boston called Thorns. And at that point, I really began to learn about the different uh, vendors and looks and, and uh, from, from sweaters to ties and uh, jackets. And one of the most interesting part of it was that many of our manufacturers were actually in the city of Boston. So I had a chance to visit quite a few suit factories, um, shoe factories, various places like that. Again, 
90% of what we had in the store was actually uh, made in the United States at the time. Uh, I was a pretty good salesman and actually got recruited and went into our family business as a salesman. But during the entire time, uh, I still would always try to find a store in whatever town I was in that had uh, the type of goods that uh, that I was used to wearing. And I have to say, I, I continue to do that, even though everyone's in their sweat clothes. I, I still wear uh, Shetland sweaters and uh, corduroy pants on a cold day here in New England. So I guess that's my intro. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to, to go back to some stories that – I remember really vividly from being a kid, and you would tell us mm -hmm. about um, when you were a kid. Um, isn't there a pretty famous incident of you um, kind of breaching the code of conduct in menswear and going to school, daring to go to school in a sweatshirt when you were in elementary school? It's true. When, when uh, I see some pictures of me as a kid, uh, we lived in actually Yankton, South Dakota for a couple of years, and I was a very dangerous looking guy with my cowboy shirt, jeans, and, uh, and six gun. I, I, in fact, I think I was in that picture. I think that's the only clothes I had. Um, I went to uh, public school in Needham, Massachusetts, and, uh, the teachers there were very, uh, they must have thought we were at a parochial school because they wanted us to all wear woven shirts and uh, button up to the top and everything. Very, There were no T-shirts. Um, and then one day, because I was cold, I wanted to wear a sweatshirt. It's, it was the only sweatshirt I owned. What would be appropriate occasions for wearing that sweatshirt in your parents' book? Would it be like cleaning out the garage day or like tumbling around well, in the I, yard I or think something? The only thing that we we would wear a sweatshirt for would be if we were playing a sport, uh, mm. either football or baseball or I mean, in other words, hockey or yeah. There, there, there was there was a direct separation between sportswear and and workwear or schoolwear. In other words, we mm -hmm. did not mix. In other words, if you where I live now in Hingham, Massachusetts, most of the kids wear gym shorts and T-shirts to school. That would have been completely verboten mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1956, Needham, Massachusetts. All right, so there you were, little Bobby, and you were yeah, cold, so you wanted to wear, yeah. you wanted to wear a sweatshirt. <laughs> that was it. That was my that was my sin. I, and, I, and as you know, it, you know, we continued to hear about that story uh, well into my adult life. So well, because was... what I thought that in that story that Mima actually went to your school and and shamed you into putting something else on. That's that, that's the version yeah. of the story I remember hearing. <laughs> Maybe my analysts will know the difference on that. I just know that I was. Uh, uh, very much shamed for wearing the sweatshirt, whether it was in front of the classroom or whether uh, it was at 123 Hoover Road. I just know it was a – and then, again, it was one of those um, uh, things where, um, you know, you didn't wear jeans to school. You, there, there's a certain uh, decorum of what you would wear. I would also imagine sneakers would have really been, like, not on the menu as school wear. Like, they really would have only been for sports. No, we generally, we, generally, okay. we generally wore uh, tie-up shoes, um, black Oxfords or something like that. Uh, sneakers were sneakers were used to play tennis or or for sports. That was mm -hmm. pretty much the um, the M.O. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then speaking of, of things that children are ashamed of, I also remember being like a – I was probably in middle school, and you would tell me about the um, – having to go to the Husky Boys shop and do your outfitting there. There was a uh, store in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was called, uh, ironically, The Prep Shop, and it was run by – a couple of it was a husband and wife team and and uh it, boy sizes go up to i think size 20 um and then when you get into buying men's clothing it begins at a, whatever your waist size is a 28 waist or 30 waist or whatever generally in even numbers and every time i would go to the prep shop uh, i would uh look at a pair of tens if i was 10 years old and I'd put them on, and, and immediately I'd see frowns looking over their eyes. And 
and said, well, we're really going to have to move him up to the 10 Huskies. So uh, I would always have this, this shame that I was a Husky boy. You know, I had uh, I, I couldn't fit into regular uh, clothing. And I, again, I didn't I, I didn't be go too crazy, but I was always very happy when I I think I turned 14 and, and went in and got a size 30 waist. And, and they actually had something called tailoring. <laughs> so the, the pants would actually fit. But. Yeah. I, I like to I'd like to think that Mr. Wolf uh probably bought a cheaper garment so that he could uh wedge it. Cut corners. Him, so. Cut corners. Well but also right. Well but also um you then had a revelation not too long ago that what they used to call a husky boy just meant you had what, you know, in some quarters is celebrated as back. <laughs> That's true. The Madeline, That's true. In other words, the Madeline ass. I, I think I think that most uh, you know we we had uh, just a a little derriere there that just didn't fit into the uh, and again the clothing industry is 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 um, especially women's clothing of course I don't wear women's clothing but I mean there's 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 sizes are all over the place somebody could be a size zero or a size fourteen depending on on how they there was no van, there's no vanity sizing. Uh, in menswear in general, but even today now, depending on, you know, how the waistline is, where it fits in different different uh, areas like that. One of the reasons the jeans were so popular um, in the 60s and 70s and since then was they were low rise. In other words, you wore them uh, waist level, and, and that way if you had a derriere, uh, they would fit. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. But the old khakis were the ones that uh, they would uh, try to get as many years as they could out of them. So you'd wear them up around your belly button. And then finally, uh, when it looked like you had about uh, four inches from your shoe to your uh, kneecap, at that point they were called high water pants and you were ready for a new pair of trousers. I think in the U.K. they just put the kids in shorts until they vaguely kind of hit their size that they were going to be when they got to um, prep school. Because that was always the thing about the kids in England wearing short pants. <laughs> well, it was actually, like the, they didn't want to get them long pants yet. It was interesting. I remember my father telling me the story that when he grew up, they wore knickers, which were mm-hmm. essentially longer pants that, that sort of you could wear stockings with. And again, there was there was no bottom that went down to your shoe, so mm-hmm. you could get a lot of wear out of them. And then after you got to the point, you, you know, where they were almost at your mid-thigh or something, then you would become a hand-me-down to your brothers uh, that were younger. And I remember him telling me with glee that I think he was, I don't know, 12 years old when he got his first pair of tailored long pants. So it was a, a rite of passage, I guess. Yeah, at totally. one time and, 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 you know, being able to get a pair of pants that actually fit. And, and actually, years and years ago, I mean, back in the 19th century, very often men would buy a suit with uh, at least two pairs of pants because mm-hmm. the jacket you would just wear, but the pants, you would generally <laughs> circulate them every a few days or so so that you sure. could uh, keep them going. I know Amanda has a guest named Kyle who she's been talking to about a lot of this stuff. And Mm -hmm. he was saying that they're like the gatekeepers of that kind of trad style, which I'm sure you're, you're familiar with that. Like, you know, some people I think like that and how they just get really up in arms when they see, you know, men wearing the classic preppy look, but you know, the pants are really short or something. And then they got like espadrilles on, and, you know, and it, they, they just think it's like, you know, the fall of the Western world. Um, what are your takes on some of these? Well, I, that I, think, do? I think the big dividing point, I guess, between the, uh, the bootless and, and, and the unhorsed and, and the, uh, I guess the clothes horse, so to speak is, is that generally speaking, you always got cuffs on your pants, um, mm-hmm. cuffs, uh, from a utilitarian standpoint, I remember somebody telling me they're always good to have cups because you could ash your cigarette in there. I don't know. Mm. If I never smoked, but that seems like a well, it's very classy. Pretty, pretty <laughs> odd reason. Odd reason to have <laughs> cuffs. The, the the other reason that people had cuffs um, was that uh, if you did, if your legs did unusually grow, you could actually 
let the cops down and be able to, you know, walk around with a with a plain bottom, as they called it. But mm-hmm. I, I think that, you know, in general, um, you know, the dividing line was really uh, a situation where where people wore pants that fit. I mean, mm-hmm. how I mean, you can go out right now on the on the streets of Pasadena and, and see people that <laughs> have their pants rolled up. They have them dragging in the street. I mean. You see a lot of fellows, I'm in Massachusetts, and it's about 30 degrees outside wearing shorts because they don't have pants that fit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they don't have it because their legs are too short. I think I think the, the shortest uh, off the rack is like a 29 inseam, and some of these guys, they just, they, 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 they just don't, they, pants don't fit. But, yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a difference between fit and, uh, and, and fitness. Now, what the uh, the guys at J Press would do in college was they would throw a sport coat on you and it wouldn't fit, and then they'd tell you, "Well, there's room to wear a sweater and a scarf." Well, well pretty <laughs> much. I mean, you could. <laughs> yeah, right. That's great unless you're wearing the sport jacket in the summertime or something. <laughs> well, and I remember that was something that is a little bit of a um, of a holy grail in secondhand shopping for for you and some friends, which is what you lovingly refer to as clothes by dead guy, where right. you just, you happen to like step into, uh, you know, maybe it's like the local charity shop or what have you. And, uh, you reach in the rack and it just turns out, you know, what's his name, you know, like, um, Freddie Worthington, the deuce, he just so happened to have the same dimensions as you. So like, bravo, Hey, presto, you've got a custom suit. <laughs> Was made for someone well, else. there was always there, there was always a belief, and and uh, you know, I, I I guess I believe it is is that that, that menswear was always made better than women's wear, and it was mm-hmm. always ironic that that when I was growing up, that a lot of girls would actually go to the boys' shop at uh, Brooks Brothers to get Oxford cloth shirts and shorts and things like that because they, these sportswear lines were generally just thrown together and they didn't want to look like their mothers, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, they were pretty well, you know, pretty well made clothes. And uh, I had a friend of mine uh, who, who's, who's, well, he hasn't fallen on hard times, but he's he's not where he thought he should be at this stage of his life. I remember he found a. Uh, Wait, Dad, is this your a, friend who uh, is this your friend who does uh, some professional driving and every now and get, then yes, yes, and has yes, bumped? Yes, yeah, yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> he's a bon vivant. Anyways, he he picked up a uh, classic double-breasted polo coat. Um, literally, people would wear when they when they went to polo matches. It was. Uh, very, very nice, double breasted, and he bought it at Closed by Dead Guy for I don't know thirty five or forty dollars. But if you think about it, even the Dead Guy, how often could he wear a polo coat? I mean, they weren't that sure, big. yeah. So a lot, so a lot of these gently used clothes, it's fascinating, and I and I still I do this from time to time. If you go on eBay, you can list stores that have been out of business for forty years. And there are people selling sports jackets. <laughs> yeah. From these different, uh, so if you have, uh, you know, a good, uh, a good tailor and a good cleaner and keep it away from the moths, you can, uh, you can have some pretty, uh, I think in the vintage clothing, get some pretty well made stuff. I mean, it was, it was, uh, and then some people had custom made clothing that was, uh, before off the rack. The real change, I think, came after the Second World War because there were so many men that were coming back, and the GI Bill. Some of these guys were in their mid twenties going to college. And these men's clothing stores on campuses just did land office business. The guy that I worked for in Boston would say it would be not be unusual to sell forty or fifty suits in one Saturday or something. Like wow, that. that's I so mean, many suits for like, mean, the, the that, kind of suits they're selling. <laughs> well, and what they would do is they would get in there, and, and if you got the right guy uh, in there, he would, well, he'd, he'd need to have at least a tuxedo for going to dances. He would need two sport jackets for going to football games and flannel so- you know, slacks and plaid slacks. And then, of course, the uh, a suit for weddings and funerals, and, and yeah, you could you could uh, easily um, 
uh, put together a, a pretty good uh, deal. Interesting little sidelight is is that a lot of fellows when they went away to schools like like Harvard and Yale back in the 30s and 40s um, had unlimited uh, uh, charge privileges. And their fathers <laughs> would, would, want, would want them yeah. to. To, to buy things. So, so what happened was that a lot of these guys, uh, lived pretty hard and gambled. And if, if they were in trouble, there were, there were people in New Haven that they could sell their clothes to, to get cash to pay their gambling debts. And there was a fellow named Five Buck and he would stand in front of Yale Station and literally sell sports jackets for five bucks that, uh, Probably were thirty five, forty dollars in the store. So, oh, what an amazing fungible quality. Yeah, the, the, the clothing in those days. Uh, that uh, it was, you know, it was something that was was in short supply, and uh, people uh, paid for it. So, and and it, you you find out also that uh, that a lot of the stores in the old days would close out their goods to places like Filene's Basement, so they wouldn't leave the, the material on the rack long enough. And there's some people that just held on to it forever. And then now there's people that are selling what they call dead stock. And dead stock yeah. are literally shirts that were sold back in 1972 that are still in the same wrapper, and they found them in the basement somewhere. You know, of course, yeah. who knows what size they are, but uh, but they're, they're well made. They really were. Yeah, something that I think is interesting about um, what you've been talking about in menswear, and in particular, um, I think that sort of old Yankee aesthetic, is what what Amanda talks a lot about on her show is just fast fashion and how so many things are now, they're so full of synthetics. And like you were saying, like particularly in um, more women's or like unisex fashion, kids' fashion, a lot of like weird cuts strange things happening with the sizing. But mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's a, a certain tradition of, um, like I've heard you talk about some of your friends who will have like the, the Nantucket red pants, which now people try right. to simulate that effect. But like what those right. really were, were very bright red pants that then are worn like season and after and season. <laughs> In fact, there's a, uh, and I had never heard of this before, but with button-down shirts, uh, the collars will fray after a while. I and mean, I don't know how many wanderings it is, but it's a lot. And uh, and then there are some people who actually trained their wives back in the 60s and 70s to turn the collars so they could get another 10 years out of the shirt. <laughs> And, uh, and then there are other people who wear the frayed collar as a, as a badge of courage. That look at me, mm -hmm. I've got, I've worn this shirt so long now it's frayed. I mean, again, it's a limited audience, but, uh, <laughs> but some people, some people seem, seem, seem to like that, I guess. It's, uh, just little touches that you can see that, uh, and there are people who, um, who, who literally, uh, uh, we'll wear, you know, an outfit at one time. I mean, it got, it got easy after a while. I mean, blue blazers, I think most, most men seem to have one of those and hopefully they're tailored and fit. But, uh, a lot of times you'll go like when we used to go to the, the Harvard club for, for Thanksgiving. I mean, 80% of the guys were wearing blue blazers. I mean, it almost looked like, they almost looked like the staff or something like that. But another interesting part of uh, clothing that I learned when I was in um, working for Gene Thorne was that shoes are very important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nowadays everybody wears sneakers or these plastic shoes with, with, with tire treads on the bottom of it, everything. But, but in the old days you would have, uh, People wore white bucks in the in the uh, summertime between Memorial Day and uh, Labor Day, or ten right, bucks, is, thirty bucks they call them. As they memorialized and, in uh, in Serial Mom, that kind of right, really made an, right. immortal, an immortal but statement always, about white shoes. <laughs> but a big popular one was a, a, a pair of loafers that were called uh, Weegians, which and the Weegians were actually a, a shortening of Norwegian, which were a Norwegian fisherman's shoe. And it's interesting because they were called loafers. And, and, and at one time in America, if you look at publications from back in the 50s and 60s, they'll be interviewing with people and they're 
guys that are admin or somebody like that, and they say, well, what are your hobbies? And a lot of them listed loafing, basically <laughs> hanging around <laughs> doing nothing. <laughs> So there was there was something to being you know wearing loafers beyond just a, a shoe that you you didn't have to it was so easy you didn't even have to tie them you just loafed into them you know well is it there um is now is a hush puppy a subcategory of a loafer it's a little more of a house shoe right a hush puppy no a hush puppy was basically uh, and again going to a prep school you had to always shine your shoes. And uh, a hush puppy was basically a suede shoe that was a, a soft shoe. And, and when they were originally made, they they were uh, they, they had a rubber sole on them, so they were easier to walk. You didn't have to get them resold or anything like that. And they were just they were comfortable. I've got one more for you. Can you describe sure. what a what a brothel creeper is? Well, a brothel creeper was 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 a uh, they generally it was. Um, Plantation crepe, they called it. I don't know what that means, but it's it's a type of a. It sounds, uh, it sounds uh, very racist, whatever it is. Yes, it does. But but there's a uh, it's a soft uh, type of a um, a sole that is is particularly known on desert boots. That was a very very popular uh, look, a suede uh, boot with a couple of eyelets that, uh, but it had this. Uh, Gummy type of a uh, of a bottom uh, Clark's uh, desert boots used to be yeah like they're the classic and, one and the, and the beauty of those were that there was no there was a welt but there was no creaking in other words it was sometimes if you have a bad pair of shoes and there are plenty of bad shoes out there um, people would uh, walk and you could hear them make noises uh, creaking sounds so to speak so brothel creepers would be a very quiet shoe you wouldn't. Uh, mm-hmm. Hear it going across the uh, the way. Fascinating thing about shoes is that um, everybody has a size they fit. I mean, <laughs> you yeah. put your foot on something and measure it. And uh, I'll, ne- I'll never forget uh, in college there was a shoe store called Barry's. They had wonderful shoes, and you'd say, "Well, what size are you?" I said, "I think I'm a ten David, ten D." And they'd go there, and they wouldn't have a 10D, so they'd come out with a 10 and a half c and say, well, try these on. They, they, they fit about the same. So whenever anybody tells you that somebody acts like a shoe salesman, it's somebody that will do anything to get a sale, <laughs> <laughs> even if it doesn't fit. <laughs> and I think that there are some people in the uh, clothing business who are, saying, who are the same way, if they could just uh, – get the sale. That was the key thing. But the final thing about shoes is it was interesting. I remember when I worked in Boston, somebody came in one day, a salesman from, I don't know what he was peddling, maybe socks or ties or something, and he said, you know, Boston's always been a black shoe town. (laughs) What do you mean by a black shoe town? He says, well, how original is a black shoe? And in those days, there were shades of tan British tan, their London tan. I mean, there were a variety of so. So if you look at the footwear, if you walk in a room and everybody's wearing black shoes or burgundy shoes, it, it's probably not a very interesting crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Like as you've been talking about the outfitting and like this kind of plug and play method of dressing oneself where you're saying, you know, you have X number of sports coats, you have these shoes, that shoes, and it does sound very coded. Like, it's almost making me think about, like, the old hanky code in the leather bars, like, that you can you can get a lot of information from subtle cues from what somebody's wearing. Would you say that that's an accurate assessment of this world? Well, I, I, think, that, I, I think that what happened was, um, and, and I, I, I wouldn't say blame, but I think he's certainly done very well for himself with, with Ralph Lauren was that I, I, I was always surprised when I was in the clothing business, actually selling clothes, that uh, people were so concerned about matching things. Uh, right. They wanted mm-hmm. to pick up a, a shirt that had a like a like a burgundy and green thread, and they wanted a, a tie that would have that, and then a jacket to go along with that. And it just seemed a little fussy to me. I mean, if I had to wear one shirt with one tie and one jacket, I'd be broke. And and it, it didn't seem to really, <laughs> yeah. I, and, and and I grew up, I guess, getting dressed at St. Mark's School in a pitch black 
alcove and I had six ties, so it really didn't matter what tie I wore. Nobody ever reported me to the fashion police or anything like right. that. So I, I think a lot of times people can tend to get very fussy. And there are some people like, for example, uh, ironically, uh, uh, Brian Williams on uh, NBC and, and Mitch McConnell, of all people, the Republican uh, senator, if you look at them, they always have a striped tie. And they're pretty damn nice-looking ties, but, but those are $175 ties. <laughs> if you talk about, you know, showing things, I mean, a lot of these people will, will obviously, uh, they, they like a nice snappy tie, and there's certainly a lot of people that, that, that just wear, God knows what they are, but, but they're wearing a tie because I have to. But it, it is amazing how people will, We'll try to mute down their jackets and things so that the tie becomes the um, the star the attraction. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I use that only as a preface, Jillian, because yes. uh, your late grandfather, uh, when he died, um, I think he had about six hundred neckties. <laughs> <laughs> well, that okay. I'm just sorry, I want to hear the rest of that thought because there's, uh, there's something I want to ask you about ties. But go on, please. <laughs> Many ways. So, so I discovered about 600 neckties um, at 123 Hoover Road, and and uh, during my my father and Jillian's grandfather's funeral, I insisted to the um, undertakers that they wear one of his ties because I hated the idea of black ties. And these were beautiful ties. They were burgundies and, and, and fuchsias and greens, and it just. And I'll never forget the undertaker said, well, we'll certainly return these after the service. I never saw them again. And uh, he was a, a physician who also taught at the Harvard Medical School, and they had a lecture once a year in his name with a lunch. So I had the idea um, that I would bring about 200 of these ties <laughs> and leave them out on a table so that any of the people that went to the uh, – the lecture uh, would would be able to pick up a tie or two, and and because uh, again, a tie is is personal, but not you don't really wear it anywhere in your house. And I'll never forget there were people saying, well, "What about that green one with the uh, balloons on it?" Well, I'm sorry, I only brought two hundred ties. You know, I'll take a note for you. But there was actually uh, there was actually one of his students. Because we went to one other uh, function later on, and the guy looked at me and he said, "You know what? I went to an interview, and I wore this tie that, that was your father's, and and all the interviewer could do was look at the tie and say, my God, what a great tie!'" <laughs> 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 I suppose the standards are kind of low, but it's uh, it, it, it's uh, but it, it but a tie, I think. I mean, trying to get to your your leather, and I mean, it is something that uh, can certainly say an awful lot, and um, and and uh, it, it is a, it is sort of a unique thing. I mean, I, I I've never been into pocket squares or things like that. Some mm-hmm. people do, but but the uh, but neckties can be fun. Unfortunately, there are very few neckties these days. Um, you look at most stores; they'll have about ten and. They're all expensive, and I don't think they're that great. But anyways, I still got 250 of my father's. <laughs> to work through. <laughs> sea of ties. I've got a burning question about bow ties. Like, because I know sure. Tucker, Tucker Carlson is probably the most famous public bow tie advocate these days, and we all kind of have our opinions on him. And then I know that you – have a brother who likes a bow tie as well. And do you have any do you have any personal takes on bow tie men, bow tie people? Well, you know, it's interesting because because if you tie a bow tie, it's always the rabbit goes out of the hole, goes into the hole when you tie it. I mean, there's a, mm-hmm. there's, there's it, it, it's just sort of like a reverse way of tying your shoes. I was never a big fan of, of the bow tie. The only reason, the only time I would ever wear a bow tie was when I worked for this one company, and the guy that I had worked for, who had since retired, always wore bow ties, so I'd wear it in respect for him. But I think I own about two bow ties. There is a great line one time. Well, there's two two stories about bow ties. One is uh, they're very popular with gynecologists, so that they're tied to work. And, 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 
And the other the other one was that uh, I think John Cheever, that uh, guy who who liked to to look into the underside of life, always uh, remarked about bow tied people that it, that looked like someone that was reveling in their impotence. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, don't, I mean, I, we'll leave it to the great one. On that. <laughs> Make of that what you will. <laughs> yes, you can. But uh, but there are. Uh, yeah, you're, you have an uncle too, um, Uncle Scooter. He's a big bow tie guy. So there there are fellows that that feel that that. The other thing I want to say about neckties, though, is I do mm-hmm. not tie a Windsor knot. I think those are the most hideous. That's the, the that's well. You ruin the ties. You spend about an hour and a half putting this thing together so it looks like a clip-on tie. I was always a fan of the slip knot where you just throw it around once and slide it through and you kind of – Away you go. That's <laughs> yeah. the way it goes, right? And I like knit ties because knit ties, you can literally sleep in them and they'll still look good because they're mm-hmm. they're knitted. So but that's neckties. That's, that's probably more than – more information on neckties than the world knows right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. It's a, it's an oral tradition. We need to know. Yes. Um, speaking of when you were working at Thorns, I know, like, on Amanda's show, she's always eager to hear, um, like, sort of stories from the trenches of retail. And mm-hmm. I know you've got them. Um, specifically, there's that invisible restitching story that I remember is, like, a banger. Right. But do you have any – do you have – uh, I don't know if you could share maybe that one, and then if there's one or two others that really stick in your mind from like that really encapsulate that experience of being a kind of well, mid 1970s menswear guy. Well, the guy I worked for was a guy named Gene Thorne, and Gene was a tremendous, tremendous salesman. But he had two failings. One is he never paid his bills because he was living such an extravagant lifestyle. And the other one so it, was, Dan, would, you, would you say he's a menswear guy who's getting high on his own supply? Was he, like, always dressed to the nines? No, not really. I mean, Gene, Gene basically uh, uh, had a store in, in, in Boston. He had a, a home in New Hampshire, and his, his wife didn't like New England, so she lived on mm-hmm. a horse farm in Virginia. I mean, these are all expensive pursuits. <laughs> yes, and, they are. And, and uh, but, but – the other thing with Gene was that he never found a customer that he didn't think he could fit. And, and, uh, and what happens in the clothing business is you occasionally will get, not even occasionally, fellas that, that have big bellies and skinny legs or no shoulders or their one of their shoulders is, sh- is lower than the other one. Yes, or something, yeah. And they're, 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 they're a lot of a lot, a lot of problems but but gene would always i mean he, he and he, he'd hire these irish tailors and because uh, they were cheap and and i remember he had this one guy come in and, and uh he said oh i'll fit you there's no question about it so he would get out there with a piece of chalk and we've all seen these people that'll touch your shoulders and touch your in you know all this sort of fussiness of trying to fit it and Gene was writing X's on this, his arrows going here. And I remember one of his lines was, he said to the tailor, now we can punch up for a big chest, right? Hey, <laughs> whatever the hell that means. So so I'll never ever forget, the guy comes in with his wife. I think he's from out of town, and he's so happy he's going to get in there and get into his new suit. And my God, it was dreadful. It was awful. I mean, it was. It, I mean, the guy's face went from a smile to. I mean, he looked deformed. I mean, it was awful. Oh no! Oh. Uh, so, and, uh, so that that was that was one story. The other, the other one about Gene was was. Uh, well, there's two other ones. One was. Gene never really paid his bills very well, so everybody in town knew what the deal was, and. One of his suppliers was a company called GT Trousers, Gutstein and Tuck, and they made beautiful, quote, beautiful trousers. And they were the pioneers of uh, finding flannel that would have uh, Santa Claus embroidery on it, or they had they have uh, 
a pair of corduroys, which were four different colors um, in the legs. And everything. I mean, they they were very they, they they made clothing for real dandies. I mean, for the top scale, for the guy that uh, wanted to show up at the Christmas party with um, you know something that was nobody else was going to be wearing. With and, tiny Santa uh, Clauses on his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, with a Santa Claus or candy canes or something like a that. A reindeer. <laughs> so, anyways, Gutstein and Tuck's factory was in an old movie theater in a section of Boston called Dudley Station. It was a bad neighborhood. I remember there was the Orange Line, which was the decrepit line in Boston, and 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 he said, "You got to get down there." He's got twenty pair of trousers to pick up. And I said, "Okay," and he said, "By the way, uh, here's the cash." I mean, this is an area I wouldn't want to be, you don't want to be carrying five dollars in my pocket. <laughs> but Gutstein wouldn't do it unless you know I paid cash. cash so I'm hand, riding yeah. on this subway, you know, and uh, you know I finally get off, and and it's not like there's a big there's a sign that that just says GT, and you got to it's it's a tough neighborhood, so everything's locked. So I'm standing out there in a sports jacket and tie. <laughs> Five hundred dollars in my pocket, and fortunately they let me in. And we walked in there. I walk, I walk in there, and Jerry Gutstein is sitting at a desk in the center of the movie theater. They've taken all the chairs out, and they've got tables all around, which is where they're making the trial. It was one of the wildest looking Santa's workshops. And yeah. I got, the guy says to me, "Well, you know, I don't know, Gene. You know, he's a great salesman." Boy, his credit sucks, you know. <laughs> so then after that, after the five hundred dollars, I get to carry twenty pair of trousers back, <laughs> back on the, on the uh, train. On the orange line, <laughs> take them back to the thorns, you know, to get the uh to, to, to get it done. So but the story about the the uh, invisible it, we we reweaving was that uh, a fella came in, we had a white suit, a white linen suit, it's a great great look. And he, he came in and he said, I'd like to get one of these for my wedding. And, well, we didn't have it inside his size and we, we really couldn't get it because they made one run of it and that was it and they were getting ready for their winter clothes. But, but Gene wouldn't give up the sale. So he said, Oh yeah, yeah, we'll get it for you. And then the guy comes in six weeks before the wedding because right upstairs from where we were was, was a place called Priscilla, the bride shop, which was a very famous, um, wedding place so he went downstairs and she's always oh, coming along it's coming along so finally he comes in the, the week of his wedding <laughs> gene comes out and says i i know i and he has this little piece of cloth in his hand maybe the size of a handkerchief and he says you're not going to believe this he was on a truck coming up from uh new york and it was uh, hijacked and torched. And it, it, it's beyond invisible reweaving. And the guy just turned around and left. Poor guy. But, uh, do it. but the, the other one last story about Gene, which was a classic, was that every year he would go down to New York with money that he had borrowed from a loan shark and buy closeouts. At the end of the season, they'd always have clothes that were left over and people didn't know what places like Barney's would have these big suit sales and everything. But they, these were the manufacturers. And there was one guy and Gene would go down and he'd buy the suits. And the, and the next thing you know, he'd ship them. So we would have an inventory of all of a sudden 150 suits. We, we never had more than maybe a 50 or 60 suits the whole season. So he would have his half price suit sale. So he would mark them all up to $250, and we'd sell them for $125. And then he would have the uh, people from Filing's basement come in and hopefully pay him $0.40 cents on the dollar so he could make – he thought he would make money on it. Mm-hmm. So one year, this guy comes in from a company called Mr. Coates. It was a top coat, and then, then Coates mm-hmm. had been – in decline for many years because people were wearing basically raincoats with linings. They didn't wear beautiful mm-hmm. top coats or anything. Except the people dying in Connecticut that were, you know, for, waiting for Gene, for my buddy Dean. But anyway, so, so he comes in and he says, I got a deal on some top coats. 
They're made in Yugoslavia. Uh-huh. These, 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 it, 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 these were like, he said, yeah, son, he, brings, he buys 200 top coats. I mean, we didn't have enough room in the store for all these top coats. And they were uh, awful. I mean, you put them on and, you know, your shoulders would be off. And they were dreadful. But not Gene. He wasn't going to be deterred. So he puts on this sale in the paper for a big top coat. So it's the middle of February. It's 75 degrees out. Oh, shit. <laughs> not, we, we had one of these unusual springs where all of a sudden, I think, I think it was 90 at Easter the next month or something. And there's just crocuses and butterflies everywhere. There are these Yugoslav top coats just, just, just oh, languishing. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, I, I think he had to pay filings to finally take them or something. But uh, but he, he he was full of these kinds of get rich quick type of things and it was it was it was the best thing in the world that ever happened to the clothing business was Mastercard and Visa because so many of these poor guys would carry these house charges and always the last person ever paid was the tailor always mm-hmm. but hey that suit's looking pretty good you think you might pay for it this year. <laughs> You buying that suit on time? Oh my God, unreal! Are there any other um, favorite stories or thoughts or reflections you have? I think the biggest thing, Jillian, about menswear, and I don't think it ever really translated the same way to women's wear. Although I do understand that there are places like Neiman Marcus, they would have people that would be sort of personal shoppers for people. That's become a new trend and everything. But what's uh, interesting to me in, in places like J Press or the Andover Shop were that you had these dominant personalities. Probably one of the best was a fellow named Charlie Davidson over at the Andover Shop who basically sold Oxford cloth shirts and blazers to Miles Davis and Chet Baker and the jazz people and you know, really, they, they were sort of confidants. I, I remember there was a guy named uh, Richard Press who for one and a half years or so wrote writes about uh, Frank Sinatra coming into J. Press and buying the the look, the uh, mm-hmm. the prep look and everything like that. But one of the things that all these stores did was they, they all had uh, salespeople that became, you became their guy. In other words, mm-hmm. if you came into the store, they would, get you to the right shirts and steer you away from this or that and everything. And, and uh, a lot of people came to rely on the, it was sort of like in some, in some places you have a barber or you have somebody that you, that you go to that you can sort of shoot the breeze with and everything. Cause you know, most of these guys were on the corporate ladder or something. And a lot of times um, I think the, you know, as, as years go on and, and, you know, trends change and <laughs> whatever even the new preppy looking stuff is won't fit on this guy anymore. A lot of them would get into custom and that was always a way that uh you could say, Well, you know, I gotta live another year because I get these pants made <laughs> or something like that. You know, so they they would uh come in to get uh to give them some business in that area. But but by and large, uh, unfortunately uh, as more people have gone out of business, more factories have, have changed. Um, there's, there's just the, the price of, of dressing has gone up. So it's, uh, it's tough. <clears throat> I mean, Brooks Brothers was probably the, 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 uh, shrine of, of, uh, of the menswear, the natural shoulder, what they call it. And, uh, now they're being run by a marketing company. So mm. <laughs> good luck. Uh, if you still look at some of the great trends in America, the old uh, barracuda jackets and the and the natural show, I mean, it, it's so different than uh, than what's happened in um, in Europe and places like that. And ironically, the biggest preppy area probably in the world these days is Japan. Yeah, you know that. Um... Kyle, who uh, Amanda was speaking with, did I don't know if he had a chance to listen, but he did that whole thing where he talked about take ivy. Yeah, and about um, yeah. yeah, but like how I guess um, the way Kyle described the take Ivy sort of phenomenon was that because after World War II there was such uh, still such an American presence in Japan yeah. that there was a lot of American you know just like pop culture influences were coming over to entertain 
the Americans who were there. And so things like um, that kind of classic preppy look, I think also that's when blue jeans kind of hit um, Japan in the way that they began to. And um, But that's what the guy who did take Ivy was expecting when they went over, I think, in 1965 to to do this um, almost like an anthropological or like a like a wildlife study of like, you know, this, right, right. this right. look in its natural habitat is that they got there and they were kind of like shocked that in, in 1965 there were seeing a lot of guys kind of slumping around the campus of Yale with like, you know, their sweatshirts on. And, you know, it was, it was that kind of dress down. Madras shorts, yeah. and, and yeah. shorts and loafers. And uh, yeah, it was a different, it was a different look and everything. In fact, the irony about, and this is a good, good way to end the, I think is that in Japan, I remember reading a, <clears throat> a story on a, one of these sites or something. And they had uh, somebody was, was, was reproducing, an exact replica of a C.H. Maslin and Sons uh, Air Force flight jacket. Now, now, our family in the Second World War uh, did a lot of made a lot of tents and, 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 yeah. and uh, canvas, but they also had a cut and sew line, and they made the sports wear, right? A lot, a lot. Well, they made sports wear after the war, but they made mm-hmm. they had contracts to make flight jackets and flight pants and and everything like that. And I remember seeing on eBay that I could get an original C.H. Maslin uh, Air Force flight jacket from Japan for a uh, modest (laughs) (laughs) $4,000. So so all I can think of is some poor guy, uh, you know, know, was shot down over Guam or something, and somebody retained it. But, again, the – there was a whole series. I mean, the the, the great trends of America, the great factories that, that made all these these products, and the American product was always so well built that it just lasted forever. And even there's a company down in Texas called Dickies, D I C K. Yeah, Dickies is like a, yeah. There's a lot of workwear and stuff, and it's also yeah, like Carhartt's too. Yeah, and Carhartt out of Detroit, and and they they made. Workman's clothes that literally lasted forty and fifty years. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's, uh, it's it's quite a quite a trend there. But the um, but but that's but as far as the um, the Ivy look, the, uh, the the dress. I I, I hope it retain. I, I hope there's some people that'll eventually leave the television set in their sweat clothes. Although I understand the sweat clothes are the new uh, streetwear, which is what the Gucci's and all those folks are selling, so I guess we'll all look like Snoop Dogg someday, you know. With our, uh, oh, we can. Well, if, and, uh, if we're lucky, we'll look like Snoop Dogg. <laughs> right. If we're lucky, if we're lucky. Oh well, I guess as, like um, Snoop. as you're um, as you're reflecting and kind of uh, wrapping it up, I was just wondering if you have any kind of like words of wisdom, just in general, not necessarily about trad style, preppy style, but just about kind of dressing and style. Like, do you have anything you would want to impart to? to a younger audience about just your, what you've learned and what you think and what you'd recommend if someone's just trying to kind of outfit themselves for any kind of life? Well, I think, I think you need to buy what you like and you need to buy something that fits. And I think mm-hmm. if, 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 even if you go to a, a resale store or something like that and, and, you know, if you, you know, natural fibers have always been, been very popular, although now, I guess uh, it's a it's a toss up because we use water to make cotton and everything. But who knows who makes some of these things? Some of these companies, people just have their labels. But if you if you if you if you find colors that you like that you feel comfortable in, if you, I mean, I think you should always buy clothes that that fit you the way you want to be fitted. You shouldn't be wearing wild plaids just because you think they're great. If you feel comfortable with them, then you know try to find an accessory to go with it or something. But I, I think in general. Uh, I just think you feel better when you when you when you're when you're dressed up. I'll give you an example. I mean, I yeah. have probably because I your mother hates this because I never throw anything away. Uh-huh. I probably have you know I'm not going to catch my father, but I might have a hundred dress shirts. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, there are shirts I probably haven't worn for certain. But even in the pandemic, I'll wear a dress shirt every day because I've got them. <laughs> I mean, you know, and they feel sure. comfortable and. I mean, I could sit around in my T-shirt all day, I guess, but 
you know, it's not that bad. It feels good. I would love to know what your, like, I don't know, proudest or, like, most satisfying or, like, happiest clothing memory is. If there was, like, a particular garment and, like, the day you first took it out for its spin, you just felt, like, you know, on top of the world. If there's been something any time in your life that, like, really stands out. Well, I, you know, I think one of the, uh, I, I think when I, when I worked for Gene Thorne, I, I mean, I think that uh, one of the things I got a big kick out of, um, and they had ordered up, and I don't know how they shipped it because we were on credit hold, but they, uh, they shipped in a Burberry trench coat. And, uh, and uh, Burberry, I mean, again, it's a big fashion trend now, but it, it, it's the, the original story behind the trench coat. You had the belt that still had the grenade clips on it. I mean, the idea, the, the British have, have, have really got quite a, um, a tradition, so to speak, of, of what they, uh, of what they use and everything. And I remember how great that felt, but, I think recently one of the things that I really got a kick out of was when we visited with you out in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area that I uh, went to a place called Union Made. I think they're out of business now. But yeah, they are now. They had, they, they had these great coats that were made by Golden Bear, which was a company in San Francisco that made jackets. And, and mm-hmm. they've, they've been around since the twenties or so. And, uh, and they're, they're, they've got great stuff. I mean, I got two or three of their coats and, uh, they're very nice. And I, I, I just get the idea today. I mean, I just like to support, if I can find them, American products. Um, because, uh, you know, that, that's to me is always a, is a big thrill that, uh, you can find something that's, uh, that fits and looks good. And, but it's getting harder to do. <laughs> it yeah. really is. It really is. But I think that Burberry, I think when I had the Burberry, I, I felt like I had arrived because I had been mm-hmm. living in military clothes and, and I had a trench coat in the military, but it wasn't as nice as that Burberry. <laughs> but it's a funny thing to think about that it's like the correlation of it, it is a trench coat. Like it was made yeah. for the oh, trenches yeah. and the idea, the idea that then to have the elevated trench coat is Right. It's just this like fantastic feeling that it's been I made know, yeah, beautifully. Yeah, they, yeah. And then they really never changed they really never change anything with it. They just uh Isn't there uh, isn't there a feature of that coat that if you flip it inside out it's watertight and you can take a bath in it? Oh yeah, yeah. And if you yeah. bought them with a with a liner you could end up uh, wearing that as a bathrobe if you were, you know, somewhere. So no, it was a very utilitarian coat. And um it's almost like a Swiss army knife of a coat. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. But, but now <laughs> it's a fashion trend. I don't even know if they make them anymore in the in the original style, but uh it's um you know, it's one of those things where uh I guess people uh but at one time it was a good look. I mean, it was a big look yeah. and uh it was uh and I I miss uh I think New York used to be a great town to window shop in and I just don't think there's too many people left anymore. <laughs> The window <laughs> shop. So, but it's uh, it, it it is fun to wear something that uh, is comfortable and and looks good. So, cool. uh, that's that's uh, that that's my words of wisdom there. <laughs> Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I'm really excited to uh, to send it over to Amanda. Thank you, Jem, for not only taking a crash course in recording via Google Voice to record this conversation, but also for convincing your dad to bless us with his presence. I mean, what a delight. This is what I needed to listen to today. I'm sure you're going to feel the same way. I'm always looking for ways to hear more voices and to include more members of the community in each episode. And Jem was my like test run for setting up correspondence pony reporters, if you will, for recording their own interviews and segments. And it went so well. Even better, it didn't cost us a dime to do this. Close Horse is very scrappy, but very tech savvy. So (laughs) if you have someone special that you would like to interview, or you want to record your own piece of recording, reach out to me and I will help you work it out. 
Which reminds me, I'm going to do a poll this week about inviting Erin, the librarian, to have her own, like, Erin's Corner. We'll give it a catchier name periodically here on the podcast. I've been meaning to put it in stories all week, but it's been kind of a wild week, so I'm going to do that tomorrow. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Our community is so smart, so passionate, and so talented. I'm obsessed with getting to know all of you and helping you share your stories. I know you all have a ton of incredible ideas to share. I mean, just look at the amazing content at CloseHorse.World. I can't wait to hear what you all have to say. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse. If you like what you're hearing, please, you know what I'm going to say, rate and review on Apple Podcasts. I love when there's a new review. It always makes my day. And of course, tell your friends to give us a listen too. Don't forget that you can find us on Instagram at Close Horse Podcast. And every Friday, I've been doing an Instagram live at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's been so fun. You know, I update you on things going on at the blog. We talk about this week's episodes. I answer questions. I talk about some other educational content. This week, we talked about mushroom leather. And this week, uh, per request by Alana, I will be wearing my strawberry dress, which I talked about in a previous Instagram live is kind of one of my most regretful purchases ever. So we'll talk about it and so much more this Friday. Also, if you want to meet some other Close Horse listeners, join the Close Horsing Around Facebook group. We have some really good conversations going on there right now. And if you need a new podcast, which I have to tell you, I know there's like a gazillion podcasts out there, but I've been having a hard time finding some new ones for myself. So just putting this out there, you should check out my other show, The Department, which I co-host with my friend Kim this week. This is so exciting. This episode will be coming out on Tuesday. And we are interviewing Wendy of Built by Wendy. I have been fangirling so hard about this all week, and I can't wait for you all to hear it. Thanks, as always, to the one and only, my other half, Dustin Travis White, for our music and audio support. Bye. (laughs) 